Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes webinar series. Today's session is about children, youth, and environment, hosted by Professor Linda Corkery and Dr. Kate Bishop from the University of New South Wales, Sydney. And this is our fifth webinar session in our webinar series. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. My name is Ye Gang Ko, Program Director of the APRU Sustainable Cities and Landscapes Hub and the Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Oregon. Before we get started today's webinar, I just want to mention a couple of things about APRU and our Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program. Uh, for, those of, uh, for those of who are not familiar with APRU, First of all, APRU is the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. It's a network of 60 leading universities linking the Americas, Asia, and Australasia. And we leverage collective education and research capabilities of our member universities into the international public policy process. The Sustainable Cities and Landscapes program is one of the APRU's primary research program and we collaborate on effective solutions to the challenges of the 21st century. And the SCL Hub has 19 core member universities across the Pacific Rim, and the Hub is housed at the University of Oregon. The SCL Hub successfully held four annual conferences, first in Portland in 2017, and then Hong Kong 2018, and Sydney UNSW, to 2020, uh, 2019, and then Auckland in 2020. Uh, each conference offered various activities that students can participate, and in, um, including like a research working groups, a design field school, a student design competition, and a research symposium for a PhD student. This year, instead of our annual conference, we offer a live webinar series organized by our working groups and celebrating our fifth year. So today's webinar is hosted by the Children, Youth, and the Environmental Working Group. And thank you so much for Professor Linda Crockery and Dr. Kate Bishop, the co-leaders of the working group and the wonderful speakers for today's session. Uh, after today, there are five more uh, bi-weekly thematic webinars on the road. Um, the topics uh, including like uh, landscape and human health and urban stormwater management, renewable energy, vulnerable and climate justice communities and intertidal uh, zones. And, and it will go all the way to the mid-December mid this year. So after today's session, our next webinar will be hosted by Dr. Chunyan Chang and Dr. Poju Chang from University um, from National Taiwan University. And the webinar will be about landscape and health, and this will be on October 26, 9 a.m. in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and which will be 6 p.m. on October 25th in Pacific time. So this webinar will discuss evidence-based research and related theories of human landscape experience and innovative technological tools and the application of healthy landscapes and healthy people. And we will reflect on the questions like, what is evidence-based landscape design? And how does it relate it to design and human health policies? And how can modern technology help fill the gap between research and application? I hope you continue to join us and explore how cities and regions across the Pacific Rim address climate change and social equity to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So please contact us through email, visit our web website, Facebook, or Instagram if you are interested in participating in our activities. And thank you and enjoy today's webinar. Now I'd like to pass on to today's webinar host, Dr. Kate Bishop, Associate Professor and the Director of Landscape Architecture at UNSW. Thank you very much, Yikang, and welcome everybody from around your different places in the world. Today's discussion will focus on issues associated with children, young people, and their environments. 
This will include persistent challenges associated with major issues that we are all responding to, as well as COVID-induced considerations that have impacted children's use of their environments around the world. The APRU Children, Youth and Environments Working Group assembled last year and currently consists of 17 members from four member nations, including Canada, the USA, New Zealand and Australia. New members always welcome and you can contact us through the Sustainable Cities and Landscape Hub or directly via email and we'll give you the right email addresses at the end of today's session. The group is multidisciplinary, spanning public health, landscape and architectural design, geography, performance and cultural studies, and environmental psychology. All share an interest in children's experience of their environments, be they physical, social, organisational, or virtual. In today's seminar, we will feature many of the working group members to give you an idea of the range of topics and issues this group engages with. The format for today is designed to be both informative and interactive. We will have two sessions of short presentations and two live, more conversational sessions. The last one of these offers you the opportunity to ask questions of any of the speakers via the chat function. So please drop your questions in when you have them throughout the session and we'll return to them later on. To kick the first session off, we have four speakers, each representing one of the four nations in the group and presenting on very diverse topics and very different environmental experience. The first two to introduce to you are Patsy Eubanks Owens and Angela Kreutz. If you two could turn your cameras on, please. Welcome to you both. Patsy Owens is Professor of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Design at UC Davis in California. Her research focuses on the role of the physical environment in the well-being of youth. And Angela Kreutz is Lecturer in Architecture at Deakin University, Australia, and conducts cross-cultural research within the field of children, youth and environments. And she currently leads the third iteration of Growing Up in Cities. Thank you both. Thank you, you can turn your cameras off and we'll enjoy your presentations now. Hi, I'm Patsy Ewanks Owens. I'm a professor of landscape architecture in the Department of Human Ecology at the University of California, Davis. Today, I'll be talking to you about young people and public space. Specifically, I'm going to start us off by briefly reviewing why young people need places for recreation and places for social activities and how public space can fulfill the need of youth for these places to play and the places to be with others. Next, I'll provide some examples of how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted and continues somewhat to impact those opportunities for youth. Lastly, I'll discuss how youth and the communities adapted to these impacts. So why are places for recreation and being with others important for young people? The reasons fall into three realms, the physical, social, and the mental or emotional health. The outdoor environment can support the physical health by providing places to move, places to play, participate in sports, or just to be outside and have fun. Having places nearby where you can get exercise, such as parks and trails, are important contributors to a healthy lifestyle. In one research project that I conducted in West Sacramento, California, young people identified opportunities to participate in team sports as well as places for skateboarding as important to their health. One of the positive impacts of outdoor environments for social health is providing places where young people can get together with others. Places such as outdoor cafes, playgrounds, and downtown streets have historically been places where people gather with their friends. This might be also places where younger children can learn how to play with others at the local playground or with teens just looking for a place to hang out with their friends. In addition, youth need to feel like they are part of a bigger community. Places where they can join in community celebrations and meet new people can play an important role in one's social health. Young people need opportunities to be part of the greater community and to develop a sense of belonging and community responsibility. This can include participating in improving or making decisions about their community. 
The young people shown here described how they like bringing healthy food choices to the community by working at the weekly farmer's market. Lastly, recreation and social activities contribute to a young person's emotional well-being by providing settings that are restorative. Outdoor places are commonly identified youth and adults alike because they feel better after they have spent time there. So how did the COVID-19 pandemic impact these opportunities? Many young people were suffering from health concerns such as increasing obesity rates prior to the pandemic. The restrictions many cities imposed to keep us safe, such as stay-at-home orders and closing playgrounds and parks, took away opportunities for young people to get exercise and to have fun. Youth, along with the rest of us, had to find new ways to stay active. Many turned to their private backyards and, or inside their homes, while those living in apartments or other dense housing didn't have that luxury. Youth from lower income families and those living in urban areas uh, were particularly impacted by these restrictions. Opportunities for social activities were also removed. Recreation centers, schools, and other community facilities were closed and those interactions halted. Many young people also saw an immediate decrease in their ability to move independently through their neighborhoods or their cities. And along with that, they had more time under the supervision of their parent or other adults. Along with the physical and social strains of the pandemic, young people had the mental strain and the fatigue that came along with this rapid change to their daily routines and to the uncertainty as to the long-term health impacts on their families and themselves. For many youth, those uncertainties were realized in the loss of families and family members and friends. Lastly, young people in many communities also faced the concerns and challenge, challenges highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement and racial justice demonstrations. Youth were rightly concerned about the structural and prevalent inequities in their daily lives and also what that they could do to fix them. Lastly, I want to end with some thoughts about how the communities adapted during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to the, and to those restrictions that were imposed upon them. Although all these impacts are pretty bleak, we also wanted to highlight the wonderful ways that communities have responded and adapted during these periods of restrictions. Many communities were able to close or narrow streets to make room for pedestrians, bicycles, and bicyclists and diners. Uh, the public right away became a place where children and other community members could gather, but they could still stay at safe distances from one another. Some cities have decided to actually keep these uh, streets as car-free zones. Citizens also responded by creating activities that would inspire others to get out of their homes. Uh, the bear hunt started in New Zealand is a great example of one activity that spread worldwide where people would put um, stuffed bears in their windows and children would be encouraged to go around the neighborhoods looking to see if they could find the bears. Also, mobile birthday parties, uh, community hopscotch, and others are some of the kinds of things that, that people did to, to get people out of their homes and to get outside. I want to end on another positive note, and that is telling you about one program that was uh, organized quickly and that has had great success, and that's the San Francisco's Hub Program. San Francisco was what, the first city in the U.S. to shut down. On Sunday, March 15, 2020, the school district announced that the schools would be closed. Various city departments, nonprofits, community centers, and others came together to think about how they could address the challenges this would cause for many of the city's children. They prioritized low income and families of color, uh, those living in public housing, homeless and foster care youth, and English language learners. They ended up setting up 86 hubs across the city to provide places for these youth to have access to computers and also staff members. Um, the first hubs that were opened uh, were opened during the summer and they were to house uh, summer camps. Uh, the recreation and social aspects of those camps continued as well as the additional educational go goals uh, once schools were back in session. Almost 3,000 youth uh, aged 5 
to 18 have benefited from the program. Uh, parents have reported overwhelmingly positive effects, such as improvements in the emotional well-being of their children, uh, having the children feel like they had a return to a sense of normalcy, and also that they've developed some supportive relationships with those staff members, and that those have been very, um, very encouraging. So thanks for listening today, and uh, that's it for me, and I think we'll have time later for questions. Thank you. As I begin this presentation, and as we gather for this meeting physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place, and in doing so recognize the various traditional lands on which we are present today. I acknowledge the Wadharong people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land on which I am present today, and pay my respects to the local people and their elders, past, present and future. In paying my respects, I also need to acknowledge the many First Nation people of Australia, both old and young, who have shared with me their knowledge and experiences encouraging me in the spirit of reconciliation to share these in my teaching and with you today. I cannot speak on behalf of all First Nation children here who have such a diverse range of experiences as they grew up across urban, rural and in many instances extremely remote communities in Australia. What I can share with you are some of the collective beliefs and situations among First Nation children in Australia and their surrounds, drawing examples from several years of first-hand experience within one particular community. To quote Margot Niel from the Cooling Nation as the editor of the book series, First Knowledges, I'd like to explain country. In the Aboriginal worldview, everything starts and ends with country. Yet there are no beginnings in this worldview, nor are there any endings. Everything is part of a continuum, an endless flow of life and ideas emanating from country, which is often referred to as the dreaming. In the dreaming, as in country, there is no division between the animate and the inanimate. Everything is living, people, animals, plants, rocks, earth, water and air. Creator ancestors created the country and its interface, the dreaming. In turn, dreaming speaks for country, which holds the law and knowledge. Country has dreaming. Country is dreaming. When speaking of First Nation children in Australia, it is important to begin with an acknowledgement of this worldview. At the same time, it is also important to recognise the continuing impact of colonisation. In 1788, there was an estimated Indigenous population of 750,000 people in Australia when the first British fleet arrived on Australian shores. Frontier violence was built into colonial culture and politics and was used to clear the land of Indigenous resistance. In the 20th century, Indigenous children were taken from their families and assimilated and placed under state care, often living in boarding houses and dispersed across non-Indigenous homes. These children are known as the Stolen Generations. They were not permitted to honour their culture or speak in their own language. Many are still searching for their families today. Similar to the situations in Canada and the US, First Nation families in Australia were segregated from other non-Indigenous Australians and relocated to missions and reserves. It is in one of these reserves now referred to as a community where I spent a significant amount of time. This community is called Sherberg on Waka Waka country and lies about 300 kilometres northwest of Brisbane, the capital and most populous of the Australian state of Queensland. The image you see here is from Sherberg in the 1940s. I researched with children in the early 2000s into the 2010s in an attempt to better understand 
their community history in the context of how they use and experience spaces in and around their community today. What do they do? Where do they go? And how do they feel? Were some of the questions that I asked. Post-colonial events are at the heart of pressing social issues such as historical transparency, deaths in custody, family violence, intergenerational trauma, homelessness and identity erosion. Physical traces of post-colonial impacts are also evident with inadequate housing, limited public spaces, with public commercial and educational buildings displaying bolted doors, barred windows and high fences. These are constant reminders for residents and their children of a once regimented and institutionalised environment. Continued effort by children and youth especially to soften these features are ongoing with welcoming road signs, colourful murals and the restoration of significant historical buildings. And despite this hardship, these communities are places that exhibit strong cultural practices in family life, embracing community focused child rearing, encouraging children's freedoms to explore and exhibiting community loyalty and having an inherent respect for the elderly. Sherberg consists of 44 different original tribal groups only one of which was Waka Waka, the traditional owners of country on which Sherberg is positioned. Many families have links to, Sher to country elsewhere and regularly travel, meaning there are household fluctuations with families coming to and leaving Sherberg. Many children also travel regularly to other communities to visit extended family in both remote and urban centres. And these journeys are important in order to take care of country. Now at this point a brief note on some of the ways how COVID-19 has impacted Indigenous Australians and their children. With state border closures and mobility restrictions, travelling across Australia and maintaining connection to country has and continues to be challenging. The closure of borders and travel restrictions were also crude reminders for many First Nation people in Australia of former government control. Nevertheless, there is a clear recognition from First Nation leaders that COVID-19 posed a real threat to Indigenous communities. And until mid-2021, Australia was heralded for keeping Indigenous Australians safe. This changed when Wilcania, a small Aboriginal community in far western New South Wales, was at the centre of a growing COVID outbreak. With infections, rates increased largely in unvaccinated Aboriginal children and youth aged between 10 and 19 years old, it unearthed significant issues and unpreparedness due to unfit health facilities. Disproportionate chronic disease rates low vaccine uptake and social makeup that doesn't allow for proper isolation. For many reasons, there tends to be a significant amount of mobility within Aboriginal communities. Children's lives are interlinked across many households. Community life is intergenerational. To give you an example, Children are often walking across the town to other households to spend the night or weekend. Nuclear families are rare, rather children refer to multiple mothers with aunties and in many cases grandmothers taking on primary care roles. Thus asking children if they can point out the house where they live on a map is often confusing. While well, within the context of the pandemic this contributes to challenging challenges of transmission, this community support and interfamily connectiveness contributes to Aboriginal children's resilience. And looking back at Sherberg, over the years all families have formed an identity and attachment to the place, including for whom country is not local. And for these children who grow up on country, they are entrusted with the cultural knowledge and responsibility to care for the land they identify with through kinship systems. And for those children who grow up away from country, they de develop strong intimate knowledge and connection to the local place 
that in turn forms the strong connection that is inherent to, inherent to Indigenous identity. These attachments to community involves a connection to the physical environment, the buildings and the landscape that surrounds, many of which are of course historically places of oppression. Identity constructions today are therefore complex but important. It is important that First Nation people, especially young people, participate in the creation of their own environments. Deep listening is a foundation of Aboriginal culture and deep listening is what is required for gradual transformation. Thank you very much. Both of you, a very strong start to the morning. Just a reminder to you all that if you have questions for any of these presenters, please put them in the chat as you go along. We will moderate them and we will, we will talk to them later on in the session this morning. So the next two presentations are created by Karen Whitten, Penelope Carroll and Susan Harrington. So if all three of you could turn your cameras on, that would be great. Fantastic. Welcome to you all. Thank you all for joining us this morning or oh, afternoon and evening, <laughs> Susan. Um, to begin with, Karen Whitten is a geographer and professor of public health research, and she investigates relationships between neighbourhood characteristics and the mobility, health and well-being of residents. Together with public health researcher Penelope Carroll, both work from the Shaw and Wariki Research Centre, Massey University, New Zealand. Susan Harrington is the final speaker in this section, and she is professor in the School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of British Columbia in Canada. She specialises in landscape architecture. And as part of her talk today, she's going to introduce you to a very interesting region in the world, which I've had the great fortune to visit. So it's a nice reminder of that place. Thank you all. Cameras off and we'll enjoy your presentations. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Karen Whitten from Massey University in New Zealand, and I'm going to speak to co-designing public space with children. My colleague Penelope Carroll and I work in Auckland, a city of 1.7 million and the largest city in New Zealand. In a COVID world, outdoor play spaces are less risky than indoor environments. But many of our public spaces have not been designed with children in mind, especially our streets. And as researchers, we've sought out opportunities to support children to work alongside planning and design professionals to contribute to more child-friendly public space design. We take a rights-based approach that children and young people have a right to feel safe and welcome in public spaces, and not only playgrounds and skate parks. Also, in keeping with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, we support children's rights as citizens to be consulted on matters that are important to them. I'll give a very brief description of three case studies of co-designing public space with children, the methods we use, the impacts to date, and then make a few observations arising from these. The first case study was Freiburg Square in Auckland's inner city. We were approached by Auckland Council and Commission to conduct a child-friendly city audit of the square prior to its refurbishment. Council officers were aware of increasing numbers of children and families moving into the central city and a lack of spaces for play. They had also initiated the UNICEF Child Friendly Cities accreditation process and knew they needed evidence of engaging children in city planning. Plans were at the concept stage, so it was timely for engaging children. The Eastern Viaduct was the second site. Unlike Freiburg Square, where we had been approached by the Council, the second and third sites were initiated by us as researchers. The Council was keen to be involved again and agreed to select sites 
based on our criteria. And these included that the organisation's designers would be involved in all the workshops, that explain council's intentions for the space to the children, take children's views into account, and also share final plans and decisions with the children, and that this would occur within about an 18-month time frame. Um, Eastern Viaduct is on Auckland's waterfront. A car park was to be refurbished as a pop-up public space. The dotted area in the top photograph indicates the site. It's a complex space with lots of competing interests. It's a walking and cycling link to the central city and a number of commercial yachts and private um, launches, as you can see, are berthed there. Also, unbe unbeknown to any of us at the time, it was to become the heart of the America's Cup yacht race. The third site was Puhanui Stream, a very degraded stream running through an area of public housing that is undergoing major redevelopment and intensification. The stream was seen as a potential recreation resource for the large number of future residents. A cross-agency program of work was already underway, but children hadn't been involved and the agencies were struggling to engage local communities, which are largely Māori and Pacific. Council was keen to establish a relationship with the local school with whom we had an existing relationship. So we managed to engage 24 children to take part, almost all of whom were Māori or Pacific. I mean, at Puanui, regeneration of the entire water catchment is the Council's long-term aim. And as it turned out, midway through our co-design process, new funding for a playground was announced and our focus expanded to enable the children to contribute design ideas for the playground as well as the wider catchment. At all three sites, the children took part in a series of workshops with the number of hours of workshopping ranging from around 12 hours at Freiburg Square to about 30 at Puhanui. And always the first step in each case study was learning from council staff about the city's plans for the site and why the urban designers wanted to know about kids' views. A similar range of interactive, interactive methods were used in all studies. The children spent many hours exploring, taking photos of things they liked and didn't like, and making notes in their notebooks. They learnt about the site's Māori history and stories, and at Puhanui they also learnt about the water cycle, the ecology of the stream, how it started in the hills and flowed to the sea, and about what destroyed or helped sustain a healthy waterway. Many children at Puhanui had few experiences of other places, so they were shown images of what was possible, what changes had been made in streams in other places, as a way to feed their imaginations. Drawing, mapping, selecting and captioning photographs they have taken were amongst the ways they developed and shared ideas. They also worked in teams to make models, to collate and present their work to each other and to council officers and urban design consultants. Designers were also given a report on the children's ideas and later reported back to the children on designs for the space, noting where children's ideas had been incorporated and where and why they hadn't been. In this example, the children critiqued the plans and gave a further round of feedback. Feedback on the co-design process itself was also sought from the children, the school principals, designers and other council staff. Feedback was universally positive, but the critical question is, did it make any difference to what was delivered in the space? Freiburg Square was a square being refurbished as a square. There were competing views on the design and conflict over whose views should prevail, but many of the children's ideas were taken into account and were incorporated into the final design. Eastern Viaduct's renewal faced competition from a premium sports event, as I mentioned, charter business interests, and it had no design champion to see it through. So while there was some influence of the children's ideas on the pop-up activities, there's been no long-term change in the public space. Finally, Puanui was always a long-term project, and the children knew that it was more likely to be their little brothers and sisters, and maybe their own children, who'd benefit from their ideas. But there have been other benefits for other children that have emerged from the project, as the designers have used what they learned to develop a process for engaging children in other schools within the Puhanui catchment. And as mentioned earlier, midway through the co-design process, funding was approved for a low-cost 
playground, and this has been built. So what factors contributed to more successful outcomes? Well, organisationally, having advocates for children, whether they were politicians or council officers, and having the participatory design process initiated, funded and owned by the council cha champions. A supportive policy framework is very important, whether it's local or, as in Freiburg, the Child Friendly Cities framework. Respectful relationships are fundamental between the adults and children, teachers, designers, researchers. At Puhanui, we also had strong participation from mana whenua, the Māori tribe of the area. And Kid Appeal, and this is a mixed blessing. It generates a lot of enthusiasm, but it can't stop there. You know, it must lead to systemic change in more child-friendly public space. And of course, food, fun and interactive methods. There are also a number of moderating factors, um, including site location. There are competing demands for space that vary from site to site, and children's needs are seldom prioritised above those of adults, whether it be business, as occurred at Freiburg Square, or sporting interests in the case of the America's Cup of Ida at Harbour. Also, um, second point, as the site scale and complexity increases, so do the number of internal and external stakeholders. And if there are conflicts, delays and design compromises ensue, and children are the likely losers. Thirdly, um, time and resources are very important for the meaningful participation of children, you know, because it takes time to build trust and relationships with kids. And they also may need to build their knowledge before they can meaningfully contribute. And this could be a social equity issue, as it was at Puanui. And finally, the timing of participation. No point in engaging children too soon or too late in the design process. The benefits of engaging children in public space design go beyond public space design itself. For the children at all three sites, they said they had fun and they liked that their views were heard. And the school staff commented on their increased confidence and the value of authentic learning that's grounded in the place where they live. And that also contributes to a sense of place. Design professionals commented on the uniqueness of seeing into children's worlds and learning that designing for children was about playful spaces and not just safety. And at Puhanui, the design team had struggled to engage the wider community and the children's project offered a way for them to connect with the school, the wider community, including the indigenous community. And as researchers, the stimulation of real world learning in a cross disciplinary context is always rewarding. Thank you. When Cornelia Han Oberlander passed away this May, we lost a trailblazing landscape architect and a dear friend. Always a step ahead and a quick step at that, Oberlander introduced many new ideas and techniques, and she forged new territory in landscape architecture. Born in Germany in 1921, Oberlander immigrated to the United States as a teenager. She was part of the second cohort of students that included women to attend Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. At Harvard, she was influenced by Bauhaus architect Walter Gropius, and she learned basic design methods that had been translated from the German Bauhaus school to a North American curriculum for the first time. After graduating with a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture in 1947, she was determined to become part of the post-war transformations taking place in North American cities. Key to this endeavor was her commitment to community design and children's outdoor play spaces. Oberlander moved to Philadelphia, where she was hired for the community, as a community planner for the Citizens Council on City Planning. In charge of Operation Fix-Up, Oberlander worked directly with community members, designing and building gardens and other spaces. And it was only 1951. Her first playground was 18th and Bigler Street in Philadelphia, and this involved research on the children. She also explored sculptures in Scandinavia, eventually creating her own play sculpture, Goat Mountain. This new type of playground caught the imagination of the American public and was featured in Life magazine in 1954. It also marked Oberlander's lifelong commitment to what Karen Witten has called a design champion for children's outdoor play environments. Twelve years later, as a mother of three and living with her husband, Peter, in Vancouver, Canada, she continued to break new ground in her design of children's play spaces, demonstrating a new model for play. At the Creative Children's Center, 
in the Can Canadian section of Expo 67 in Montreal. While organizers initially conceived of the outdoor play space as a holding area for children waiting to get inside the creative center, Overlander quickly convinced them that the outdoor play environment was a source of creative play itself. Oberlander's outdoor play environment for Expo 67 was a tremendous success. I still encounter adults who fondly remember playing there as a child. A 1968 analysis of the children's attendance numbers found that the outdoor play environment was the most popular, with 30,000 children visiting in six months. Oberlander's has speculated that one of the reasons the outdoor play environment was more successful than the indoor component of the center was that the outdoors afforded free, spontaneous play, while the interior provided specific classes and activities. Oberlander continued designing children's environments and in particularly integrating natural elements and risk into play, which was an idea that most landscape architects didn't understand in the 21st century. She would drag in natural elements into the climbing space for balancing, she designed wobble walls or a meter plus high, and water was added where children could completely immerse themselves. Over 50 years through her built work, lecture, publication, construction process itself, she promoted recycling, native plants, water conservation, conservation, and biodiversity. She linked this work to a growing effort to slow and mitigate the effects of climate change. In fact, Oberlander was one of the first landscape architects to practice in Canada's far north. I will dedicate the rest of this lecture to East 3 School in Inuvik, which combined her new techniques of designing in the North and continued her efforts to create children's play environments. With financing from the Northwest Territories and government, Inuvik began preparing a new school for 1,050 kindergarten through grade 12 students. DK Consulting of Yellowknife performed an extensive planning and visioning study with teachers, staff, parents, and students. Architect Gino Pinn of Pin Taylor Architects in Yellowknife immediately asked Ober to join the team. Oberlander possessed over a half a century of expertise in children's play environment, and in 1992 she had worked with Pinn for the design of the Northwest Territories Legislative Assembly Building in Yellowknife, 1,104 kilometers south of Inuvik. Their collaboration resulted in a number of design approaches geared specifically for the North. Located two degrees above the Arctic Circle, Inuvik is a landscape of extreme change. Temperature can range from minus 57 degrees Celsius in the winter to 32 degrees Celsius in summer, causing dramatic shift in freezing and thawing. Moreover, due to its location above the Arctic, the impacts of climate change have become extreme. Referred to as Arctic amplification, this region has witnessed some of the first and greatest signs of global scale climate change. In fact, temperatures have risen twice the rate of the rest of the world in these high latitude parts of the Earth. With a population of approximately 3,600, Inuvik is the largest town in Canada's north, north of the Arctic Circle. It's also diverse, comprising Nihat, Gwich'in, Inuvik, Dean, Métis, and non-Aboriginal people. Meaning place of people, Inuvik is situated 97 kilometers upriver from the Beaufort Sea on a plateau overlooking the east channel of the Kinsey River Delta, which contains 45,000 lakes, and it plays a crucial ecological role in the region and the globe. It not only provides habitat for polar bears and other threatened species, but it also moderates the hydrology of this semi-frozen territory. The delta's marble-like pattern of alluvial deposits underlain by permafrost functions much like a giant sponge. It controls the timing and magnitude of discharge between north flowing rivers and the Beaufort Sea, a marginal sea of the Arctic Ocean. A major design influence in the Arctic is snow. Patterns of snow drip have been dramatically changing the past decade. Drifting snow has changed as a result of alteration in wind heights and the patterns. Snow drifts in the Arctic are shaped by the Coriolis force, a movement caused by the rotation of the Earth. This force is at its greatest at the poles. Lower, stronger blowing snow combined with the Coriolis force has made snowdrift calculations increasingly complex. To determine the building's configuration and site plan, analysis of several buildings and planting layouts and orientation were studied in relation to snowdrift. By identifying potential snowdrift patterns on and around these elements, they were able to determine the configuration and limits of doorways and shelters, as well as locate the children's playground. Since the wind was lower to the ground than normal, this was particularly critical because snow gusts average at the height of a child. 
as a result, result of fluid dynamic studies, Oberlander created a long berm called, and called for additional tree planting at the school. Like most Arctic communities, the majority of Inuvik's land is comprised of a thick blanket of permafrost, a thermal soil regime where the earth has remained below zero degrees Celsius for two or more years. Permafrost affects almost every aspect of life in Inuvik, from transportation, water supply, food gathering, hunting, to building practices. It also influences the engineering of sewage, water lines, and other utilities that are constructed entirely above ground in a series of utility doors. During the summer months, norming the top few centimeters of permafrost thaws, creating an active layer above the frozen permafrost ground where plants grow and animals and insects burrow. As early as the 1960s, scientists began recording the decline of permafrost and the accretion of the active layer in the McKinsey River Delta. Referred to as this process of top-down thawing, the active layer has been growing in depth as more permafrost melts. In some instances, this process has created 20 centimeters of vicious, viscous earth over hard, frozen soil, which traps the water, oversaturates the active layer, and creates pools of standing water on the surface, ultimately killing plants that thrive in the soil and hampering new construction as well as existing structures. The effects of the oversaturated soil include cracked foundations, distorted windows and doors, damaged plumbing, and destabilized trees called drunken forest and slumped land. To address the permafrost conditions, the school was raised on a, over a bed of gravel with pilings driven in 10 to 20 meters into the earth. The raised structure served several purposes. It created a gap between the warm building and the permafrost. It minimized heat transfer to the ground. It, allowed for the heat, it allows for the heating that comes with permafrost freezing and thawing. It accommodated the movement of small wildlife to cross underneath, and it channeled blowing snow under the building and away from the building entrances. Inuvik's growing season is extremely limited, with approximately 30 days of complete darkness in the winter, and there were no nurseries. Using an approach she developed in Yellowknife, Overlander collected plant tissue, seeds, and cuttings on the site prior to construction and brought them to Vancouver where they were propagated in the facility and returned to be planted. These plantings included el uh, edible berries such as cloudberry, bear berries, and soap berries. Accompanied by her grandchildren in 2012, she returned with 5,000 plants to be installed on the school site. Overlander also designed a shelter belt. With approval from Inuvik elders in 2009, she and Norm Hall began the process of identifying trees to be transplanted to the school site. They selected mature specimen, specimens of birch, spruce, lark for relocation. And that summer, the trees were moved and replanted to the school based on Oberlander's planting plan that was um, traced back to a Bauhaus planting method. The school also serves as a community hub in addition to the school-related activities. Based on Oberlander's 50 years of experience, she designed an environment that combines small hills with logs. And she removed the Mackenzie River roots and other elements and brought them up as climbing structures for the children. Given the extreme temperatures of the region, metal was not an option. In the school is a multi-purpose congregation space, which you can see in Area 2. This is demarcated by a large circle. The space is used by the school children and the community to play games that include spear throwing, knuckle hopping, and blanket throwing. By examining Overlander's approach to designing for children in the far north, it's hoped that others working and living in the Arctic Circle will begin to adapt their design practices to meet the Thank you very much. All excellent, thought-provoking topics touching on very significant challenges. Uh, thank you to all the pre pre presenters for assembling those for us. This next section will be run a little differently as a conversation between two members of our group who will use the next few minutes to reflect on the issues just raised and to introduce their own points of interest. So I invite Mariana and Claire, you can wave at the camera, please. Thank you for turning on your, your, your mics and cameras. 
Mariana Brassoni is Associate Professor at the University of British Columbia, and she researches child injury prevention and children's risky play, focusing on parent and caregiving perceptions of risk and the design of outdoor play-friendly environments. And Claire Edwards' research and practice explores the provision for young people's access to place and space. And she advocates for increasing the opportunities to play throughout our public realm. So welcome to you both and thank you for leading this session. Uh, I'll appear back on the screen when it's time to wind up. Thanks so much, Kate. Uh, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here and to be amongst um, such an incredible group of researchers. Um, as I was listening to the presentations, it, there were some really key learnings that came out for me that I, I just wanted to highlight um, uh, before turning over to Claire to talk about uh, some of the things that came through for her. So with Patsy Owen's presentation, she shared with us the importance of public spaces and supporting a community's well-being and how this was made particularly evident during the COVID-19 pandemic. And she provided inspiring examples of communities that recognize the importance of quickly pivoting to open up public spaces and adapt their use to help local communities cope with the COVID-related stressors. Angela Kruitz reminds us of the devastating effect of colonization and how this still influences the design and use of spaces to this day and how critical it is to deeply listen to First Nations children in transforming their environments to support healing and decolonization. Karen Witten and Penelope Carroll offer their experiences with co-designing public spaces with young people, outlining the ways that these efforts can be supported, the things to consider when planning for these co-design processes, and also the vast benefits that are involved, um, that all involved can gain from these processes. Uh, Susan Harrington offers us the inspiring work of Cornelia Hahn Oberlander in the Arctic, showing the possibilities and beauty of design that practices these key tenets of deep listening to children, understanding the physical, ecological, and control cultural context of a site and using this information to build a school that is so much more than a school. And together, these speakers remind us that the design and availability of public spaces often neglects children and youth, particularly those from traditionally marginalized population, and that the benefits of working with children and youth from these communities are vast, not only for the children and youth themselves, but for the entire community. While this is challenging work and far from straightforward, as we've seen with many of the examples provided, the rewards are vast and the benefits can be felt for multiple generations. I just want to hand over to Claire uh, for some of her thoughts. Hello, everyone. I think it's also worth noting the work's uh, alignment with the sustainable development goals, such as goal three, promoting good health and well-being. Goal 11, sustainable cities and communities, including the creation of inclusive environments. But perhaps not so obvious are the sustainable development goals relating to goal nine, resilient infrastructure. And goal 10, reducing inequalities. And goal 15, protecting and restoring ecosystems. And within all of that aspects um, of in integrating indigenous people's knowledge. So, Mar sorry. Yeah, no, that's you go, Mar you go, Mariana. Yep. Well, I, I was I wanted to ask you a question, Claire. You know, in our respective work practice, we, we focus on increasing the opportunities to play in public space and, and throughout our built environments. And, and one really uh, substantial upside to the pandemic has been government's willingness to close streets to cars or, or severely reduce car speeds and open streets for play and all for all ages of recreation. So I wanted to uh, ask you to reflect, what do you see as the things that cities can do in the long term to plan for this kind of temporary use and street closures or even permanent closures? Well, I think um, Cyclovir in Bogota closes approximately 120 kilometers, kilometers of streets every Sunday. And I think there is there are enough precedents now to prove that the positive health benefits of temporary street closures 
And this has been even further emphasized under COVID and as Patsy pointed out. So in this, if I can just point to the short term, I see no reason why every council or city can't integrate weekly or monthly street closures, even for just a few hours. And this could be linked to allowing markets to take place at the same time, adding to the vibrancy of place. It's really the political will that is required and the governments have shown their ability to commit. So um, yeah, I think we should move forward with it. And I think emphasis should be placed on opening up streets in denser areas with limited access to green space or safe space first for children to play from a spatial equity perspective. And in the long term, it's complex, but I think we need government interdepartmental collaboration. And that includes planners, placemakers, traffic engineers, and health professionals, importantly, working together on master plans through an equity lens, again, to prioritize those with the least access to playable space or, and green space to establish which streets are potentially community hubs and create networks around these streets where the emphasis is switched from cars to people. For example, when we view, if we view streets as, as boardwalks that allow for informal recreation, dining and promote independent mobility, the space for cars naturally needs to be reduced to accommodate this but evidence has shown that not all main streets can survive without customers arriving by car. In this instance, hopefully slower card speeds can be introduced. This again has been shown to increase uh, playfulness, playfulness such as in the Woonhofs in the Netherlands and in home zones in the UK. In this kind of ideal future world, playable, uh, world, again, we could plan for weekly street closures to cars to allow for activations or markets. I think we need, in between this, uh, temporary experiments to test which streets can be permanently closed. And um, New, York's, New York's a really good example of, of where they've been doing this, and um, including, for example, the Times Square example and Yang Girl's evaluation of where both cars uh, and people coexist. Sorry, that, that was yeah. a long answer. <laughs> well, and I'm, I'm struck by that answer and also by the presentations that we heard on how many examples there are around the world of, of successful initiatives that have closed streets or, or adapted streets for better use of their citizens. Um, and I'm just wondering, and you mentioned the importance of the equity angle. So are there things that we should be particularly considering when it relates to um, the opportunities for um, having uh, greater access for traditionally marginalized populations and, and being able to use these opportunities as, uh, as an equalizer? Well, I think one of the first tenets about play is that wherever you're looking at, you need to ensure that there's the time, um, that space is easily accessible and there's the permission to do so. So if, if you're um, from a marginalized community, one of the things you need to know is that you're welcome in that community. And um, to do that, then the emphasis shifts to the need for community development and for co-creation projects to increase ownership of space. And importantly, municipalities getting to know what a marginalized person's play looks like. For example, in Australia, by providing a barbecue in public parks, it's a great equalizer. People from diverse backgrounds and often gathering in large family groups make use of this free provision and free space. And here you can observe all ages in the family socializing or playing games together. Um, so I think it's identifying the needs that's really important and that community, community engagement is critical at this point to know what um, the demographic needs are. Um, another example perhaps is the simple provision of seats and how this allows for informal hanging out for all ages 
and also for parents and carers and the community to gather and watch over younger children while they play. Um, uh, yeah, so there's two examples there. Excellent. Thank you both. Brief and lots of interesting invitations to talk about really terrific topics there. I'm afraid we're going to have to frustrate everybody and keep keep moving. But the area you just opened up is, is one that I've, I've worked in for, for decades and, and know that there's a full conversation to be had on how we handle accessible play. All right, I'm going to move it on. Thank you both, Mariana and Claire. Our next session brings you the work of three researchers that help demonstrate the translation of our applied research into significant impacts for the contexts of children's lives. So our next speakers are Fatima, Brioni and Victoria. And so if you're all there and can turn on your cameras, we'd like to meet you. There you go. No, Victoria's disappeared again. Can she come back? There she is. Okay, terrific. Everybody wave at the camera. <laughs> Thank you all. Fatima Amanpour is an associate lecturer in the School of Built Environment at UNSW Sydney. Her research and advocacy effort focuses mainly on children's environments, including schools and neighbourhood settings. Brioni Trezaza is a senior lecturer at UNSW Sydney. Her research examines how young people use digital media to express changing ideas about childhood. And Victoria Durr is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies, California State University, Monterey Bay. Her work explores relationships between sustainable communities, place-based education, social justice, particularly in historically excluded communities. Thank you all for your, for your presentations this morning. I'll say cameras and mics off, please, and we'll enjoy them all now. Thank you. Hello. In this presentation, I focus on children's life in school environments and how we can improve it post pandemic. My particular attention is to overcrowding as a current issue that children are facing in schools. This is not a new issue, but can have serious consequences in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. Children make up a large proportion of new infections in Australia's current outbreaks, and it has caused an increasing concern about their safe return to schools. Early evidence indicated that schools were low risk and children were unlikely to be very infectious. But with the recent COVID variants, it's becoming clear that children and youth can get and transmit COVID-19 in school settings, and transmission clusters and outbreaks can be large. Physical distancing and use of outdoor spaces are on the list of recommendations to keep children safe from COVID-19. But would children be able to practice physical distancing when their schools are overcrowded? My PhD study shows that overcrowding is a significant barrier to children's free activities within school playgrounds. The study involved three public primary schools in Sydney, Australia, and I used three methods of investigation, behavior mapping, walking tools, and focus groups to collect the data. The results show that overcrowding easily jeopardizes children's movement and interrupts their play. The Australian guidelines for the development of schools require schools to offer at least 10 square meter per student. This standard was met across all the three schools in my study, but children still felt their schools were overcrowded and didn't offer enough space for them to play. Why does it happen? Is it the guideline that needs to be revised or do children use the school grounds in a different way from what we anticipate? My study shows two underlying dimensions. The main reason was that not all the school ground spaces were popular among children. Two thirds of the space in each of the three schools was covered by asphalt, where children were not even allowed to run, and honestly, they didn't prefer to. Grass areas provided affordances supporting a variety of children's activities, but they covered only a small area of schools. See what happens when the school has only one limited grass area. 
She ran sensitive to the crowd, couldn't safely use the area to play their small made up running games or practice gymnastics or to simply sit and talk with their friends without being afraid of getting hit by the balls flying around the soccer court. The second reason was that one fifth of the school grounds space was classified as out of bounds areas. Children were officially banned from these spaces just because the school staff couldn't supervise them directly. These spaces were poorly maintained and didn't receive enough attention while they could support children's play activities. It was impressive to see how some children, particularly boys, found their way to access out of bounds areas but it wasn't necessarily the case for some other children. So if you have to live with COVID-19 in a new normal, what are the strategies to cope with overcrowding and lack of space for physical distancing? Here come some recommendations. By replacing asphalt with quality ground surface materials, children's activities can be spread out across a wider area of school grounds to reduce crowding. Increasing children's access to natural environments can also help avoid overcrowding. Research shows that natural settings usually attract cohorts of students that are small in size. Possible undervalued spaces can be appreciated in the school grounds to support children's free play. Multiple and separated settings can be provided to offer multiple cohorts of students suitable secluded spaces to avoid conflict. Research shows that cohorting can reduce transmission rate even if a median of three feet was kept between students. A cohort is defined as a distinct group that stays together throughout the entire school day during in-person learning so that there is minimal or no interaction between groups. Lastly, where a joint use agreement can be negotiated with the local council, the required play space can be located off-site when it's in close proximity to the school, easily accessible, safe, and secure. This is not quite common practice in Australia, but has been seen around the world, so we have a lot to learn from them. Thanks so much for watching. Hello everybody, my name is Brioni Trezais. This is a brief presentation on uh, the role of the digital in creating hybrid play environments for young people during COVID-19. During COVID-19, the conversation around the digital in relation to children and young people has focused on the following broad areas of concern. Digital education, its affordances and limitations, the digital divide, access and increased disadvantage, screen time, impacts on learning, creativity, connection and isolation, and the real play value of digital games in place of embodied and spatially located play. The onset of lockdown life highlighted our social and cultural weak spots. In terms of the capacities of our national schooling systems to not only provide young learners with adequate technological resources, but to also deliver quality learning experiences for young learners through those resources. It also highlighted in a very different way, ways in which the digital was contributing to a creativity renaissance of sorts, and what I call in my disciplinary background of theatre and performance studies, emergent formations of hybrid digital play. And here I've included an image of my uh, six-year-old daughter playing with her friend on screen, where her friend is uh, becoming the Zoom baby in the pram. We saw in the early months of lockdown uh, in 2020, people from all ages and backgrounds deploy creative play practices through a range of platforms, Instagram, TikTok, Zoom, that stretch, test and reimagine the affordances of digital infrastructure in ways that demonstrate agency in acts of self-representation, resilience through creativity, intergenerational enactments of care and pedagogies of responsiveness. Because of their visibility and also often their shareability, these acts can generate creative chain reactions of users who also become creators. They dynamise the interplay between the domestic home space and the digital space. So what is hybrid digital play? Well, many of us tend to think of play as an accessory to the seriousness of life 
as an indulgence, as decorative fun that augments the serious business of our life worlds. But as neuroscientists, psychologists and educationalists have long understood, play in its most involved of forms is for human as well as non-human animals an evolutionary necessity. In her description of monk seals at play, Diane Ackerman reminds us that play invites problem solving, allowing a creature to test its limits and develop strategies in a dangerous world. Creativity theorists Michelle and Robert Root Bernstein add that uh, in world play in particular, this is not some obscure form of make-believe, but in fact key to building the conditions of a neuroplastic brain. They find childhood world play so important that they call it an apprenticeship in absorption and persistence, discovery, synthesis and modelling. And importantly for evolutionary developmental psychologist Dr Peter Gray, the most important type of play is intrinsically motivated, that is, it's done for its own sake, not for external rewards such as trophies or resumes. It's guided by mental rules which structure the activity but also leave room for creativity. It's imaginative in the, in the sense that it's seen by the players as not real and it's also conducted in an alert, active but relatively unstressed frame of mind. Implied in these frameworks is the sense that play is the best way the very youngest of learners not only find a sense of self and practice self-agency, but actually learn. But less is understood of how techniques of this kind of deeply embodied spatio-temporal and sensory motor play, uh, paracosmic play, can be mobilised by the digital. Do lockdowns automatically lose play? A new partnership between the UN University of New South Wales, Australian Theatre for Young People, Shopfront Arts and Q Theatre examines play-based learning strategies in the context of arts education practices pivoted for di digital contexts. While we know about the enormous transformation many performing arts companies achieved in delivering live arts productions on a range of digital streaming platforms, Less is understood about the radical and remarkable transformation youth-based arts practitioners achieved in reinventing their workshop practices for online delivery, often for very young participants in the context of imminent sector collapse. At Shopfront Arts, they sent out activity packs, they used them to play games, build towers, play hide and seek, and work on accents as well as build hiding spots. And one of their uh, parent participants uh, sent feedback through saying this is a great outlet for their son, for his emotions and to help him process everything that was going on during COVID. At Q Theatre, they developed a, a showcase called Our House, which was um, a simulation of one singular house built out of individual domestic spaces, bringing their community of participants together in one digital space. At Australian Theatre for Young People, their holiday workshops online uh, continue that connection to creativity and play, uh, keeping their young people connected, um, even though they were in physically distant environments. So while this research is in its very early stages, some early findings are showing us that these youth arts companies use play to reach vulnerable youth, to maintain as well as accelerate engagement with and access for diverse and often isolated communities and also to foster uh, creativity learning which is so vital to young people's mental health and resilience during times of crisis. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Victoria Durr and I'm going to be talking a little bit about children's transnational experiences and ways to promote engagement um, for a sense of belonging. My work really begins with Teresa. She's standing here in a park in Santa Fe that her family helped to create. They generated the ideas for the murals and the murals brought a very rich cultural um, symbols into the park where she had a strong sense of belonging and where this park served as a sanctuary from um, drugs, drive-by shootings, and gang violence. 
and she emphasizes in her embodiment of this park that family memory passes through generations and is successfully enriched to create a collective narrative from which families draw a shared sense of identity and place and society. And while this sentiment could be true for many children, it's especially important for children of immigrant families. Immigrant children bring their cultural histories with them, such as these children whose families migrated during the time of violence from Guatemala to Mexico. Children born in Mexico still draw pictures of the war in Guatemala, of the violence that was done to their families, their community there, and to nature. They carry this with them as part of the ideas that they have about nature and place. They also carry positive idealizations of nature that are brought to them through stories. In this drawing, a girl drew a place in Mexico that is the plains. And she, in the back of the drawing, you see mountains that are actually remembered mountains from Guatemala. So in this drawing of a single place, she merges the landscape of memory of Guatemala with her home place in Mexico. So when we engage children and youth in thinking about um, the design of places, uh, in this case, when we worked at a middle school to redesign an outdoor classroom setting, it's important that we allow immigrant children to feel a sense of belonging by expressing and even identifying through research how they experience nature and place in a transnational way. In this um, activity, we had children interview a family member. There were children from families who spoke 14 different languages in their homes, so a very diverse group of children, um, immigrants from all over. And um, they all spoke about different aspects of nature and gardens and food that were important in their home countries. And children were able to bring that forward and express that in their own ways. We also know that children and youth from immigrant communities often live in low-income communities and communities of color that can have more negative experiences with nature and the environment. And in research among a youth in Milwaukee, the Latinx youth had the lowest place attachments and sense of belonging of children um, within their study. But children who had a strong ecological place, meaning new places to play outside in nature and could bring forward and draw from that to start to create a sense of belonging for themselves. So we know that one way of supporting children um, of immigrant families is that nature itself can serve as a holding space, a safe space for sociocultural adaptation especially when we link that with tools for validation that provide intergenerational models and storytelling, whether digital or through arts, and that then these are good precursors for social action, where immigrants have successfully been involved in creating a sense of place and belonging themselves through placemaking activities, participatory planning with sustainable communities, and serving as intergenerational ambassadors, where children are serving green action research teams across um, the generations in their school and community. And these are powerful modes of engaging um, children, starting with providing a sense of safety and validation and then moving into social action. So it's important that we build the time and the safety nets and the expression before we engage in social action um, in order to help immigrant children feel a sense of belonging and direct connection to their whole selves with the projects with which we work. So I just want to share, um, these are some of the references that I drew from in giving this short presentation. Um, the, many of the drawings were from this book, and all of these are here for you. Um, if you want to email me, um, I can send them to you. Thank you. Thank you all for some very interesting vignettes. Um, I hope we're all enjoying uh, the insight into the breadth and depth of work being carried out in this area. 
And that brings us now to our final section of our seminar um, today. And so I'm going to invite my co-chair for this working group, Professor Emerita Linda Corkery, to turn her mic on and her camera on. Now, Linda is a landscape architect and planner, and her research addresses urban green space planning and design, landscape performance and sustainability, and people and place and human nature interactions. So she's a broad, wonderful background that we are all benefited from being her colleagues. I'm also going to ask all the panelists, please, to turn on their cameras for now and mics when you're answering a question. And everybody, please feel free to post some more chat questions in the chat. We've got a few, so we'll use those to kick off the session today. But we're, if we don't answer them all today, we'll, do, we'll answer them post-seminar. So we've only got a few minutes remaining. So I'm going to ask Linda if she'd like to identify what she's been monitoring on the chat as a kickoff point for today's question and answer session. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, it's been a wonderful series of presentations, and as always, we have a great variety, but when we can identify the thread that runs through them, I think that's always a bonus. Um, and one of the threads I'm hearing, and one of the threads that I think I'm going to pick on one of the questions that has come out um, around opening up dialogue with young people, and in particular with young people in Indigenous communities. Angela, you used the terminology of deep listening. Um, Karen talked about it in co-designing. Uh, Susan told us about how um, Cornelia Hahn Oberlander engaged with a, a, an engagement process in, in the Arctic project. Um, certainly, Victoria, your work very much so Fatima, your research has engaged with children. Patsy, we all are doing this in, in different ways and in different formats. And I just wonder, Angela, if you could kick off on some thoughts on opening up dialogue in a deep listening mode. And what does that look like? How do we, how do we go about that? Um, well, I can answer that in the um, in, you know, First Nations context in Australia. Um, first of all, but I think it is relevant to to a lot of um, you know cultures um, and, and all children. Um, but in Australia, I think it really depends on um, where you're doing your research. So from my personal experience, um, in remote communities, you would approach elders um, in the first instance. In rural communities, you might work with agencies, schools, and organisations. And in more urban context, you would look uh, towards Aboriginal corporations and legal traditional owners. Um, but I think deep listening in terms of a Western um, methodological context, it comes closest to grounded theory. Um, and that really means respectful, ethical, systematic um, and useful research that removes ethnocentric assumptions um, and to really boil it down to what does that mean um, in terms of engagement, I found um, walking and talking to be one of the, the best sort of engagement methods for deep listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's terrific. Thank you for that. Um, Brioni, there was a, was a question about um, if social media has been a positive or a negative force in young people's lives during COVID. Now, I think the examples you showed us would suggest it had some positive impacts. Do you want to talk a little bit more and speak to that question? Sure. Um, I, I'm not sure we can make that a yes, no answer. And I'm also kind of going to just uh, position myself aside from the, the researchers who are kind of deeply engaged in measuring, measuring those outcomes. And you will find researchers on either side of that equation. And we also have seen that kind of commentary come through a lot in our media. Um, uh, my, my, coming from my standpoint, I suppose we can observe the, the capacity for uh, new, new ways of connecting and new formations of connection taking place. Um, I have a lot of questions around whether we have the social and psychological equipment to help young people process and manage some of the more polarising dynamics of what I feel like is, uh, you know, we can understand as both an intimate form of communication that is also public. 
So um, while they're not so new anymore, I don't think our institutions, our educational institutions, our family institutions have kind of caught up with how to model that form of sociology in, in a, a productive way. And perhaps that's why I wanted to find an in in my research uh, where I felt like uh, young people uh, were working in a co-responsive participatory way uh, with arts leaders and I suppose exploring the potential dynamics of, of that shared space. So you could say there are moments where those potentialities are being experimented with, stretched, um, and, uh, and, and also then I suppose supported. And that, that's, that's my point of interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Patsy, I wondered if you could speak to um, some of the ideas that Claire put forward about um, local councils and cities making a pivot in terms of how public space is used at, at particular times. We've seen it in this crisis mode, being able to quickly adapt and do things differently. Um, you know, what does it take for a city to create a hub like San Francisco did? Yeah, no, that's um, really, is, glad you picked on me for this because as Claire was talking, I thought she really, she really identified the importance of the political will. And I think that's what we have not seen pre-COVID-19 pandemic is that many of us for, for many years have tried to make the argument to, that we needed to close streets for certain times and do certain activities. And so I, I think that was a really strong piece. The, the one thing I would add to it I think what's also happened is there's been a public education and that the public can actually put more pressure now and, and sees that this is a possibility. And so that they can have a play a really important role in changing the political will. And so I would just say, that's what I would love to see happen. And that I think all of us could help move that along and, and just not to forget that, right? To remind people that you know, this is what can happen if we all get behind it and that there's really interest in that. Because uh, I think it does, a lot of this has to come from the grassroots. So. Mm, great. Well, final question, I might sort of put Susan and Mariana's um, presentations or discussions together. Mariana, you researched children's risky play and, and the potential for injury and the importance of risky play. Susan talked about how the playgrounds of Cornelia Hahn Overlander in those days were introducing a, a, another dimension of play that didn't look so safe. Um, how do you feel about the way the environments we provide children um, are? Um, yeah, it's uh, one of my, one of the challenges that I do, and I and I think Claire mentioned it to our, during our session that some of the key ingredients for um, creating fulfilling and stimulating play environments are time, space, and freedom, and that freedom component is is a place that I spend a lot of time in, in terms of trying to get um, adults to let kids do what they want and need to do and just get out of the way. Um, and so, and, and that's adults, not only the parents, but also the designers, the educators, the supervisors, et cetera. Uh, and so Susan and I do a lot of work together where, where I kind of do my bit around trying to loosen, loosen up their risk perceptions and then, and then she can really get in there and, and do her design. Susan, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, please do, Susan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of Cornelia's work, it's so interesting because her uncle started Outward Bound. And so she okay. sort of grew up with this, this idea of risk taking as being beneficial. And, um, it, and that really helped because when I was writing about her, I was just starting to do work with Mariana, who introdu introduced me to Ellen Sandsetter's work and Risky Play and, and how we might um, start to integrate risk taking into play environments in their design. So, and I think Cornelia was ahead, way ahead of us by decades. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. Victoria, you're the children and young people that you're working with are in super risky conditions and situations. Um, and I, I was interested in your comment about nature as a holding space. You know, what a beautiful way to think about it. Um, would you like a, a few, another, comment there, another chance to comment on the importance of how we how we um, can help accommodate 
young people making these trans transnational um, transitions. Well, I'd like to um, highlight the, um, the there's a paper that I cited there that's a really beautiful uh, description of that. Uh, that was work with children in Montreal. Um, and um, I just loved the framing of that. So, and I, I see that as a place, uh, the way that, way that the authors of that article spoke about it, as well as what I see is that um, nature is a place that doesn't have the same rules as the societies that they're moving in and out of. And so it's a place that people, uh, children can feel more freedom to explore and create their own rules, which draws on what some of the other people have been saying. And it's a nurturing space for, for many people who often have migrated from more rural places to, to where they end up. And so even if it's a family memory of nature, there's a connection there that they can bring forward. And um, it can be a really beautiful way to help them acclimate and enter to a, a new uh, space. Mm, thank you. Penelope, we, and we, we, we need we to wrap pro up. Probably better go. We've run five minutes okay. over time. And it's and as you, this Thank is you, a everybody. lovely, rewarding group to bounce ideas around, and we get some wonderful discussions going. But we have held everybody for five minutes longer than we promised, and we're starting to lose them. So, so can I throw to you, Kang, to to do her final sign off, and then I'll be back to wrap it up. And, and but thank thank you all for a, a wonderful session this morning. All the faces on the screen, mm -hmm. wonderful support of the event and the group all through the year. Thank you so much, uh, Kate and Linda and all the speakers. It was a fascinating session that I learned a lot about, you know, even like as a mom of a five years old, I learned how to better engage with my, my own son and, you know, how he understand the space in the, during the COVID and, uh, and in etc. You know, it, it was a really wonderful session. I learned a lot. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, for the attendees, everyone, thank you so much for joining. And the recording will be available uh, soon, and we will send you the, you know, the recording as soon as it's ready. So stay tuned. And um, I just type the, the registration link for the, our next webinar, which will be about landscape and health. So please join us again in about two weeks. So yeah, thank you so much for, yeah. Yeah, this wonderful session. And I will pass it to Katie. Kate again. <laughs> thank you, Yikang. And, and thank you to APRU for hosting this webinar, in particular to Grace Graham for all her support behind the scenes. And she's the reason the wheels have been smooth this morning. And, and thank you, as I have said, to all the presenters this morning for their wonderfully rich um, presentations and for their support for the working group for its first year. And of course, particular thank you to Linda Corkery for her work assembling this excellent program and, and the session today. And last of all, but not least, thank you all for joining us this morning, this evening, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. We hope you found it extremely thought provoking. And um, we will be keeping the conversation going on these important issues for children and young people. You can contact our working group. I'm hoping Grace will put up the screen in a minute that gives you our email addresses. That would be great. You can contact either Linda or myself through these email addresses if you'd like to become part of this group um, in the future. And uh, that would be wonderful. Everyone's welcome. So stay safe and well wherever you are and goodbye from us for now.